Let's now look at the model for a single can. Uh, in this figure, right, we have flow coming in and flow coming out um, of the orifice, and obviously the water fills here. Uh, we can choose different variables to uh, uh, to represent, you know, what's going on in the system. We might be interested in the height, uh, volume. They're related for the system. Um, we might also be interested in the pressure here, and we'll talk about that shortly when we build this model. So to build a one can dynamic system model, we can apply um, the mass continuity equation. It's the simplest way. Um, and uh, what, this, uh, what this equation says, right, is that the rate of change of the stored mass is uh, the, basically the, uh, the net sum of the, the mass flow in less the mass flow out. And if we assume incompressible flow, in this case this is water, then this is going to simplify to the simple equation that, that, that we have here, which is the rate of change of volume stored uh, in the can is just, again, the net sum of uh, flows coming in and flows less the flows going out. Right Now, th this is the beginning of our a state equation for the system, except uh, you know we, we might know this, and we always assume that we know the inputs to a system, but we need to determine uh, the, the, these flows that are leaving in terms of states or inputs, right? That's what, that's what our goal is when we're writing state equations. That means we need to uh, define uh, our system elements very carefully, and that's what we do when we're learning how to do systems modeling, and that's, this is a good example of that. Uh, for so in this case, you know, we we might identify that we've got potential energy stored right in in, in the can um, as the water fills up, and there's certain assumptions we make right in, in, with a with a with a hydraulic system like this. We have we assume that it's, there's a quasi-static assumption. In other words, the energy is purely potential that 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 it's not moving that the water's not dropping really fast. So that say so think of the pressure at the bottom of the can is only due to the static height right. We also are making the assumption here only for the purposes of, of, this, of this experiment that this is a constant area tank and that allows us to relate area and volume easily. At the end of the day, what we want is a pressure-volume constitutive relation, right? That's what defines our basic element. The other basic element that we have here is, is, is uh, the, that, that orifice, which we, I'm going to show you we can model that as a, a, a resistive element. I'm going to show you that we can come up um, with a relationship between the pressure and the flow through that. And that's the key one that we're going to look at in this in this course. Now, actually, I won't show you in detail. It's in an appendix, but uh, I'll show you the uh, the end result of that uh, of that of that constitutive model formulation. And then, of course, you you know the other element you could have in the system is other flows. But we're going to assume that in this case we don't. Uh, you know, we in the bottom can we would have flow coming from the top can, but we're not going to have any input uh, to the top. Say that's controlled. So consider the, the, just the model of the hydraulic can or the tank, right? Uh, we uh, consider that the pressure at the bottom of that can or tank, any of the pressures here, is really just uh, stat the static head. So it's just rho g times the height of the fluid, right? In the case of this constant area tank, uh, that's easy, it's easy to show that pressure is related to the volume linearly through this uh, constant, where C is defined as the hydraulic capacitance. And all you need to know is the area and the density of the fluid. The other tanks would have relationships between pressure and volume that uh, is a relationship that's not linear, right? So if you had a spherical or a conical tank, then that relationship would still be pressure versus volume. It just wouldn't be a linear function of volume, and that, that would uh, complicate things a little bit. Also, if you had inertial effects, like if, if that was a long, skinny tank and it was falling very fast, then again, that would not be a simple tank. It's not what we have in this case. Uh, the air orifice or valve uh, model is through that flow through that uh, bottom of that can. I'm going to again refer you to the appendix where I show you in some detail, you know, how uh, we might start from some basic concepts that you might have seen before in your fluid mechanics course, how the flow through an orifice is related to the pressure drop across there. This relationship is very common in, in fluid models like this in hydraulic systems. Uh, basically what you have here, the key thing to look at is that the flow rate through that orifice is a function of pressure, right? And, and hopefully you're learning that whenever you have an element like that, that that's, that's a resistive type element. It could also be pressure as a function of flow depending on 
the relationship that you're looking at. Is Q the input or is pressure? Here we're thinking that pressure across that orifice is what's driving the flow. So we write it in this form. My pressure is driving that. The, this nonlinear functional form comes actually from the Bernoulli equation. And that's what's shown in the appendix, uh, looking at, at just uh, some basic concepts, again, from fluid mechanics. Um, we introduced this sine function. All this allows you to do is to use this function if the pressure was to reverse, which it doesn't happen, it doesn't occur in the can, right? Once it, the flow, uh, the the can finishes, the, the flow actually stops. So actually we want to watch uh, how much volume we have because if, if the pressure goes to zero, then the flow stops. And But in some systems, the pressure could reverse itself. So this equation is general for that case, if, in case the fluid was reversing itself through that uh, across the orifice. Again, refer to a more detailed discussion in the appendix on, on the, uh, how this model is derived. So now let's look at how you derive the state equation for that single can, for the one can system. Um, now we only have two flows. Um, we'll keep it for now, the flow coming in and the flow going out. So the rate of change of volume in the can is just Q in minus Q out. Again, this is an input, but Q out now takes this form, as we just showed. Um, but the pressure now, we're going to use the constitutive relation, right, for uh, the constant area you can. When we do that, we can um, do some manipulation here, show that at the end of the day, we get this nice relationship here that says this, this is a first order differential equation. This is a state equation for the one can system. The rate of change of volume in the can is just whatever flow you have coming in, minus some constant k. Now note that this k is kind of a composite parameter. I've integrated you know, all these other parameters into it and just leave volume in here. And also volume has to be greater than or equal to zero. That's important, as I mentioned earlier, when you're run, building your simulations, you, if volume goes negative here, you're gonna get, get, you're gonna get an imaginary number. So make sure you uh, change your equation. Once obviously volume goes to zero, then um, dvdt goes to zero. Right? You, can't go, you can't go negative there. Um, Nice thing about this system is k now, if we kind of make it a composite parameter, that's the only parameter we need to find. Now we can think about experiments that uh, we could design to find k, right? So how do you find k? So there's two options. Actually, you'll see in the appendix by doing a little bit of modeling, you can actually calculate a theoretical value. Now, it's theoretical, but it's also ideal in the sense that you know, when you have flow going through an orifice, you have these all these non-ideal effects. If you remember, there's a vena contracta, there's some, some losses there. The ideal coefficient that I'm showing you in the appendix ignores those contraction coefficients. So it, it, it uh, allows you to make an approximation, though. So this k ideal takes this ideal k naught here and it allows you to come up with a number so you could actually run some initial simulations, and I'll ask you to do that in the pre-lab. Um, uh, so that's one way to come up with k, and you, we don't actually actually ask you to specifically do that, but um, it actually might be in the in, in the lab evaluation where we'll ask you compare uh, your predictions with your you know these ideal values versus the experimental ones and, and 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 see how different they might be, and again the other option is to measure those k values. But again, what experiments do you need, and that's what I want to show you in the following: how you can actually come up with uh, specific experiments that would tell you what to measure and why and then how you could use that to parameterize your model. And that's what we'll talk about next.